life and make something out of a crazy quilt that saves hundreds of lives. Ladies and gentlemen, academics, scholars, students, explorers, adventurous, and fellow travelers. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the Father Crespi collection of Cuenca, Ecuador. The late Dr. Paul R. Chessman, former director of Book of Mormon Studies at Brigham Young University, received a most unusual assignment, which he faithfully performed for many years during the 60s, 70s, and 80s of the past century. Dr. Chessman had arranged us to meet the Catholic priest and view his antiquity collection. In the center of the city, the twin towers of the Church of Maria Alexadori stands above the entrance. We entered through a slide door, found ourselves in a small open air enclosure facing stately hand-carved wooden doors. We had not waited long when a young friendly man bid us enter through the old wooden doors and ushered us into the private chamber to await Father Carlos Crispy. He at once recognized Dr. Chessman, the leader of our group, and extended an embrace of friendship. I expected an older, more feeble, and far more eccentric man. I judged that the old padre of 86 years was in excellent physical health. He possessed a keen, sharp intellect. I have since learned that he was a scholar with impressive academic credentials. His list of accomplishments long before we ever met him is well known. In 1982 at his death, Italy conferred the Medal of Merit of the Republic upon him. Indeed, his credentials are impeccable. We were unprepared for what was to come. Crespi took a large key from the ring that hung from a braided belt around his robe. He moved to an obscure wooden door and turned the lock. He and his helper disappeared into the dark room. They reappeared with a large piece of metal that had been molded and hammered into a long sheet. It appeared to be gold. The metal was inscribed with curious forms of artwork. I ask our good-natured leader to pose for a photo holding the plaque. It was a gold mask. Cameras began to click. For the next three hours, we photographed and examined the unique collection of artifacts. Metal plaques with unique symbols proved to be of great interest. photograph made by Dr. Chessman of a metal plaque with inscription was forwarded to Dr. Barry Fell of Harvard University. On an examining this plaque, Dr. Fell declared the writings were of Libyan Egyptian. He said, and this plaque has become known among scholars as the Massa, Massanessa plaque. The script announces the death of Massanessa, king of Liberian Egyptians, known to have died in the year 148 BC, and the ascension of his son to the throne of a united Egypt. Among the artifacts were numer numerous bronze pieces of metal with obvious Egyptian, Persian, and Old World art motif. Plates of various metallic compositions with unique inscriptions were brought from the room and photographed. Stone, stone tablets with ancient inscriptions were also a part of the collection. The cameras clicked, the momentum accelerated as Father Crispy 
excitingly elucidated the story of its age-old treasures. Restraint, restraint was a little hard to maintain. As the, each of us stretched our necks and our eyebrows to see what would come next from the room, we crowded the doorway, venturing a few steps inside the unlit, dusty cobweb chamber, each of us hoping to catch a more circumspect view. We photographed the plates, and I might add, Father Crespi finally took his fingers and joined two bare wires together, turned on the light, and beckoned us to enter the room. The step pyramid and row of inscriptions was a metal plate that very much interested both Dr. Chessman and Barry Fell. Padre Crispy clearly understood our interest, finally yielded to an inspection of the room. Shelves of dusty, worn ceramics from forbidden yesteryears. Stereoid idols of hideous stances, strange proportions. Stacked from floor to ceiling were hundreds of large cardboard pieces on which were wired metal bracelets, earrings, nose rings, necklaces, some untarnished by time. Hide scrapers, tools, implements of war, spears, axes, clubs of wood, metal, and stone were stacked everywhere. Father Crespi's mysterious room was overburdened with antiquity. The room was overflowing with objects from the forbidden past. Perhaps one of the most intriguing was the many plates of bronze, brass, silver, and gold. Many with strange inscription, hieroglyphic grinding. Some were engraven with old word pictographs and symbols. Many were engraven and replete with engravings of animals, the elephant, the snake, the jaguar, wild beasts of every kind. Both the chariot and the horse were clearly etched into the metal. We spent the afternoon with Father Crispy, Dr. Paul Chessman, Newell Parkin, a banker from Bonneville, Wayne Hamby, an undergraduate student from Brigham Young University, and Dee Craig Anderson, a Utah State University research associate and advisor in agriculture to the Ecuadorian government. He acted as our interpreter. In all my travels, this was to be one of the crowning experiences. I had never witnessed such an enormous and an amazing collection of artifacts. As I viewed Dr. Crispy's collection, my mind kept flashing back to the story of discovery of the subterranean world of Juan Moritz. Here they were, in front of me, plates, curios, antiquities, just as Moritz said were to be found in his subterranean world. I could touch, photograph, see them for myself. The artifacts, in our opinion, were real and genuine. This is the College of Sassilus Sino. This is inside, where the assistant of Dr. Crespi shows us additional metal plates. We asked the old priest how he came by such a marvelous collection. He told us he had been the parish priest for over 50 years, that he had studied at the University of Milan in Italy, where archeology span had caught his interest. On graduating, he became a priest, was assigned to the beautiful city of Cuenca to work among the Indian people whom he had grown to love. Here in Ecuador, he had ample opportunity to further his archaeological interests. To his great surprise and delight, the religious celebrations over which he presided brought a host of Indians bearing gifts to the kindly priest who had attended them in baptism, marriage, trouble, and death. His collection began to grow till after 50 years it filled many rooms. A museum was constructed to house the collection, but a few years previously it had been set afire from the act of an arsonist. He'd salvaged three full rooms of the relics of the fire. One room of relatively obscure and unimportant tributes, one filled with items of curious antiquity, and the last room, a treasury of gold artifacts and Incan pottery. Where and how do the Indians come by them, we ask? Oh, they get them from the jungle, from the caves and the subterranean chambers of the jungle was his matter-of-fact reply. There are over 200 kilometers of tunnels, starting right here in Cuenca. They run from the mountains down to the eastern lowlands near the Amazon. Today, the Ecuadorian project scene of Dr. Chessman has changed. 
President Spencer W. Kizzle, Apostle Mark E. Peterson, Dr. Paul R. Chessman, Juan Maritz, Dr. Warren Cook, Padre Carlos Crispy have all passed on. I alone am left to ponder as I sit by the fireplace on a cold winter night or feel the breeze on my cheek on a warm summer evening, left to ponder the subterranean world of the Amazon, where a library of two to three thousand metal plates await their exposure, their exposure to the explorers, the academics, and lettered men of science. Wow, what a bunch of unique and fascinating things by J. Golden Barton. I think it's fascinating to hear his account and what he's got to say, um, what he's been able to see, uh, him just being able to personally meet Crespi. Um, you know, it's hard to tell if these people are sincere and all that they say. You know, Neil Armstrong went down to these caves. They tell me there's over 200 kilometers. Um, you know, for somebody at this time period that was an astronaut to go to these caves, what's really going on? You know, um, everybody was in love with Neil Armstrong at this time because of the things that he was involved with on um, that facade of space. But <laughs> they loved him. So, of course, they would invite him. But, of course, we already know that Neil part of the government. We already know that Neil part of the lie. Let's not fool ourselves here. But what I think is fascinating about all of this is the aspect of the mysteries of why these artifacts were here in the first place. The whole world is here. America, America, the Atlantis. And again, like we say, we know that part of it sunk. We know that some of Atlantis is right there in the Bermuda Triangle, right off of the coast of Peru. We know that Florida was part of this. We know that Pilot Point was part of this in Louisiana, what is now called Louisiana. We know about the Cahokia Mounds. We know about the Spiro Mounds. We know about the Mississippian culture. We know about the Xi and the Old Mex. But it all comes together in these artifacts and these caves. It's even more tripped out than I'm seeing artifacts that's coming from in relation to Babylonia or Assyria. They never said that America was involved in such manifestations. They never said that America was involved with countries in this type of manner. What's going on? What is the secrets? To the explorers, the academics, and lettered men of science. Will we ever know? What I have seen, I have seen. And that which I believe, I will continue to believe. I leave each of you to discern for yourself the wonder of Padre Carlos Crispy and his rooms filled with ancient artifacts from the wondrous past. I thank you for your attention. Appreciate the Ancient Historical Researchers Foundation's invitation to share my experiences with you. I have an unpleasant duty. This is difficult. I am forced to bring up a subject of plagiarism. Stephen Schaefer, author or fraud. The self-aggrandized best-selling author of Treasures of the Ancient, Recent Discoveries of Ancient Writings in North America, published by the Cedar Fort Press in 1996. I do not want to appear to be mean-spirited. Nevertheless, the time has come for me to publicly state that Mr. Stephen B. Shaver made a serious error when he published and claimed as his own material, which he did not author. To add insult to injury, some of the facts referred to have been twisted, deliberately adjusted, and misrepresented to satisfy self-manufactured purposes. To add insult to injury, some of the facts referred to have been twisted, deliberately adjusted and misrepresented to satisfy self-manufactured purposes. 
The Ancient America Research Foundation is a no-spin zone. It will investigate any worthy claim to antiquity using reason, science, and honest forthright evaluation. It will leave conjecture to others. It is dedicated to the revealing of truth wherever and whenever it is found, irrespective of the source. Fraudulent claims will be exposed. It is believed that this approach best serves those who explore, dig, and investigate into the wondrous past. Thank you for your every consideration. What is their significance? What are we looking at here? Th they're metal plates. These are two bronze plates. They were, uh, they were in uh, the ownership of uh, Father Crespi, uh, an Italian father living in Ecuador. And uh, he collected many, many pieces and uh, Indians brought him Local people brought him uh, when he helped them always some gifts and uh, he said that those plates were brought from the Cuevas de los Tallos, uh, the famous underground tunnel system in Ecuador. Now I have heard of this but maybe some of our viewers haven't. What, what is that? This is something which I've heard described as the metal library, is that right? Could be that those pieces are from this metal library. They are not. They were not accepted by official uh, 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 patrimonio cultural. That means the the uh, uh, ministry. Uh, they did check on all the pieces of uh, of Father Carlos Vaca, and as those two pieces had nothing to do with the pre-Columbian culture, they were not accepted as original. Uh, the strange thing is that uh, a few months ago in Bolivia they found out some translations of writings on stone monuments in uh, Bolivia and they found out that this writing is connected or is Sumerian writing. And if we are talking now about Sumerian writing or Phoenician writings found in South America, we have here one plate which usually, from our view, from the scientific view, has nothing to do with uh, South America. Could you hold it up for the camera? To see yes, it? sure. So we can. We you can see have it. here half human with a bird and wings, bird head and wings, and here is the tree of life. Uh, the same uh, found in Babylonia. The uh, this is. I hopefully, and I think we checked it already, is an original, but uh, there is uh, one, the same uh, statue, the same form in the British Museum made out of stone, but much taller. 
and found him in Babylonia. So but it doesn't means, look like a bird. It looks like a reptilian uh, to me, a reptile. Yeah, but has wings. It has wings, yeah. so that's why you call it a bird. Yeah. Okay. For what we we understand is that uh, there is a version of the reptilian that has wings, but that's you know uh, not proven, of course. But interesting is that uh, Sumerian writings on very very old statues in South America. Again, the question is if those monuments can be proved that they are much older than. Uh, three, four, or five thousand years, and that means it could be that the writing came from there to near east. It could be that the writing came from there to near east, to near east or Middle East. Now, there's writing on this particular yes place. Also, this this uh, man. His face is not South American Indian face and also the clothes has nothing to do with any known pre-Columbian culture but there is also a story or legend from Lake Titicaca from Bolivia that there existed the so-called Kingdom Kingdom Akakua and especially the Brotherhood, the White Brotherhood. So if you look at this man it could be that it is from this age or from this legion kingdom or what, however we can call it. It's a very interesting piece and the symbols which are here on the bottom I never ever saw on any other artifact. So that's not the process. same as the, no, the, the global pre-Sanskrit no, pre language. It is different. It is different. That's...